Good morning, everyone. It's uh, it's really good to be here. It's my first time in India, and it really makes me happy to see so many people who care about JavaScript. Uh, if you look at the first JavaScript conference, it had a really short schedule. It was Brent and I. What is JavaScript anyway? Launch and a quick wrap up. <laughs> so we're making progress, right? And uh, I, I think that's a really really good thing. Um, so I'm from Sweden. Uh, so basically. Wherever I travel, it's going to be nicer and warmer. <laughs> you can't hear me? Is that better? Can you hear me now? That's <laughs> Can you hear me now at the back? No? Should I? Do you hear anything or is it just, ooh? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep on talking and you work with the sound. Okay, great. Well, and, and also what I like about being here in India for the first time is that you do have a, a sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I do a lot of science, and you know, uh, stay in your own lane and stuff like that, that that's lovely, that's really funny. Uh, although I think you're a bit shy, you're not honking enough, so if you could express yourself a bit more, I, I would appreciate that. So I, I do run the Mozilla Hacks blog, and uh, the point with the Mozilla Hacks blog is our developer facing blog at Mozilla. We want to make sure that people can learn things about the open web. It's not only about Mozilla technologies or things that we do, it's uh, for everyone who's a web developer. Like we were trying to cover Node.js, uh, mobile performance, etc., etc., as much as we can. Uh, I also tweet, uh, usually, actually, the good things um, no. nowadays, I would say, I'm partial, so, uh, about Bitcoin Live in the open web and then Firefox OS and such. Um, and when I go to a conference, I, I can usually talk about technologies and details and such. And then after the talk, you have a lot of people coming up to you asking about Mozilla in itself, what Mozilla actually is, uh, and, you know, how do you make money and all of that. So basically, Mozilla is a non-profit, and, and the reason for Mozilla for existing is to keep the web open. We don't want just one player to own it all. We don't want one company to have control over the technology or how you do things. We want everyone to be a part of it and everyone to be able to take a part of it. Uh, and uh, that's working on the money part. Uh, we make money through different donations and partnerships with service providers and such, uh, but we don't have any stockholders or something like that. So basically, we do the things that we believe are good for the web, not to make money or not to have a, a pretty report. Uh, we do a web browser, uh, as you might know. Uh, and what I like about the web browser market right now is that if you look back a few years ago, it was only Internet Explorer, and then Firefox came out to try and make things better. And I think the web browser climate right now is excellent, because we have such good competition right now, and especially if you look at JavaScript, the JavaScript performance over just the last few years has improved so, so much. And I'm really happy about that. And some people think that, oh, you know, for instance, with Google Chrome, that Google Chrome is getting a lot of user, that must be really bad for you. Like, no, this is perfect. Like, we want to have diversity. We don't want to have 100% of the market with Firefox. That wouldn't be a good thing either. We want to make sure that it's balanced. Uh, so right now, we're in a really good place. Um, we also talk a lot about uh, integrity on the web um, and for people to protect their data. <laughs> um, so, you know, about Facebook and, and everything else. And I'm, I'm, I and so we're completely fine with people sharing. It's just about knowing that the things that you share are going to be available to a lot of people. Um, so, you know, just Keep that in mind. We also try to stay atop on trends, uh, like what's happening on the web right now compared to where it was before. How can we make sure that we actually adapt to the things that people are needing right now? And uh, to be slightly more serious as well, I think we have a climate right now, and I might be biased because I live in Western Europe. But if 
you look in North America and, and Europe in particular, that people have too much money and people are too spoiled. With the New York Times, people having subscriptions for New York Times, the average number of devices that they use to access the New York Times are six. Like people have six different devices to access it. And that's you know, it, it's fun, right? But it, it's kind of beyond reason. Uh, and I think it's about the mindset where we are right now. Uh, like, you know, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. And I, I think that's a good summary. And what, where we're trying to go there is in order to make sure that everyone can take part of the web and, and also contribute to the web. And, and we'll tie into what I'll be talking about Firefox OS. Um, when we bring up Firefox OS, it started a few years ago. And if you look in the mobile sector, uh, especially with Apple and with Google, that they have a huge amount of control over mobile. And we were looking at Firefox, how can we offer Firefox and then something completely open to uses on different platforms, and basically, more or less, we can. We can't offer Firefox on iOS because we're not allowed to. Uh, we can offer it on Android, which, is, which we do like. We can't offer it on Windows Phone. So we're looking into different options. How can we make this better? And we came to the conclusion that we need to build a mobile operating system based on web technology. So it's only HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, and it's also making sure that when people wonder about Firefox OS phones, like, OK, if you compare Firefox OS phone to an iPhone or a Nexus 4 or something like that. And, and the way it is right now, it's not the same thing. That's not our initial target. We want to make sure that everyone can take part of the web, so it's more about making it affordable uh, in as many parts as possible of the world. So if we're looking at South America, we're looking to Eastern Europe, and over time, uh, definitely hope we're going to come here and have some, something available in India and Africa and so on. And, and I think it's also about a lot of people that are going to come online in the next few years. Like the, there's a evaluation that two billion more people are going to come online in the next few years. That's two billion, that's a lot of people. And most of them are going to do it through mobile. Uh, and if you look at Africa, there's more people that actually have mobile phones and have access to electricity. So they have charging poles for a charger phone and then they go off again. Uh, so how can we offer a smartphone experience for them? Uh, you know, they might not even have a phone today or they might have a feature phone like an old Nokia where one button is bigger than the actual display. If you rub your face to see what you're actually typing. Uh, if you're lucky, you have two lines. Um, so how can we get them a smartphone experience for more or less the same price? So that's where we're aiming initially with Firefox OS, in emerging markets to bring smartphones to them with open technologies. Over time, uh, I, I think it's going to well, change as well. I think we're going to see Firefox OS on, on a number of different devices. Uh, I think, you know, I have no idea, but maybe next year or something like that, you're going to see different hardware partners that we have, like LG and Sony, etc., having more expensive phones. So I think we're going to have a wider range of devices as well. But initially, we want to make sure that everyone can be a part of it instead of just trying to compete with existing ecosystems. Uh, and a few months ago, in the uh, beginning of July, the first Firefox OS phone was released, uh, which was really a special moment for me because I've been around since started a couple of years ago, and it is something unique to actually go into a store and see the device in people's hands and actually start using it. And they were selling for 69 euro, uh, which is pretty cheap. Uh, you can get you know, 10 Firefox phones for one iPhone or something like that. Um, so I think we're aiming in the right direction. If you look at other countries like Poland, it's even cheaper with a subscription. And talking about different hardware partners, um, we have a few, like LG, Sony, CTE, Alcatel, and such. Uh, and one partnership that was announced a couple of months ago was with Foxconn. And Foxconn is the company that built the first iPad, for instance. Um, and they were talking about bringing Firefox OS to a, a wide range of devices. Uh, so we're not only talking about mobile phones anymore, we're talking about potentially tablets. We're talking about having Firefox OS on TVs and such. Uh, and that's what I think makes it interesting. If you can imagine just building something that you already know, you use web technologies, but you can ship it to any kind of device, any kind of resolution. Uh, and that's, that's really promising, I think. And, and we'll see 
what they're going to release. It's up to them what they want to invest in, what they want to release first. But I think for me, it's about the potential. Like, where can we go? How far can we take this? Uh, and talking about the history, I, I wrote a short, uh, actually a long uh, blog post, how it sort of all went down, how Firefox was started, what happened during the last two years. So if you're interested in seeing how it actually came about, um, that would be a, a fairly good read. And then talking about mobile, uh, with mobile phones, people want to have apps. Uh, that, that's already been established. For me, I'm more of a URL kind of person. I want to open a browser, type in the URL, and I'm done. I do everything on the web. But people want to have apps. So we were looking into how can we still use open technologies like HTML5, but package it as apps. So we started working with something called open web apps. And the idea with open web apps is basically just reusing what you already know, what you already can. You don't have to learn a new programming language. You don't have to use a specific IDE or something like that. If you build for the web, Firefox OS is just another platform that it will just work on. Um, and I know you might not trust me, like I'm just trying to sell you something here. But I think um, the, the point here is basically we need to use what we can. We don't need to reinvent the wheel over and over and over again. I think we need to get away from from things like this, like with QR codes, like there's more of like a two-page instruction how to use it, or you can type in a URL, right? And I think we want to get back to that kind of simplicity. Uh, we want to get back to making the web more powerful. So building open web apps, it's quite easy. Uh, whatever you already built today, you can use that on Firefox OS as well. You can use responsive design. Your website, your mobile website, for instance, will work out of the box on Firefox OS. Then, and it's completely optional, if you want to package it as an app and have the app experience, you can add a manifest file. And a manifest file is basically just a JSON file describing your app. So it outlines the, the version of your app, uh, the, the name of the app, different icons for different resolutions and such. Uh, who built it? And you can also have different localizations if you support more than one language. And that's it. Then you're good to go. Now you've created an app. So it's, it's really, really easy to get going. And you have two different ways of building apps. We have packaged apps and hosted apps. And hosted apps means that you can have it in your own website. You can have it as an app with a manifest file and being installable, but you will still run the content from your own website. So you will control all the updates, the content, etc., and no one else will you know, tell you when to do it or when you can release it. It's all up to you. And then if you want to make sure that you have offline support, you can use for instance, app cache in HTML5 to make sure that it works offline as well. With package apps, it means that you can have all the files in your app and just zip them up in one file and you install that zip file on the device, which means that you install all the files directly on the phone and then they will run locally there. The difference uh, when it comes to security with package apps versus hosted apps is that with package apps, if you have it in the Firefox marketplace, we can review the code and we can make sure that it's secure and then you'll be able to access more hardware and more APIs on the device. So that might be one upside, depending on what you need to do on the device, and what kind of needs you have for your app. And looking back to 2007, when the first iPhone came out, uh, and they said, that, well, everything's going to be the web. Just build web apps, and it's going to work. Uh, and then about one year later, they, they kind of gave up on that, and they went with Objective-C and the App Store and all that. And personally, I think they, they took the wrong path. I think the problem was that uh, the, you know, the web was just documents for people building for iPhones back then. They couldn't access contacts, they couldn't access anything on the device, it was just rendering pages. And I think the path they could have taken instead, uh, which is the path we're trying to take now, is to offer more access to the hardware, to offer more access to the phone. So we started a project called Web API starting to build up all of these APIs to make sure that you can do more things directly from the web. No other dependencies on the actual device. Uh, and it's also making sure that, you know, kind of right ones uh, run everywhere. That's not really true with Java, but still make sure that you don't have to adapt for any kind of platform or device. But just right at once, access API, that's going to work. We're going to take care of that. 
And also when it comes to web APIs, and you can look at other players in the IT sector, they come up with new ideas uh, and they build their own thing that they need. One thing that's really important for us is standardization. So with the APIs, we're trying to get all of them standardized by W3C. We don't want to build something just for ourselves. We want to make sure that as many as possible support the APIs. We want to make sure that uh, other web browsers, other platforms also support the same things. So you can build something and it will work everywhere. And a few of the APIs have already been standardized, and uh, a lot of the other ones are in the works. And if you look at the security in, in Firefox OS, um, you have a few different levels. Uh, one level was just normal web content, something you would render in a web browser. Uh, you also have uh, content being rendered within a hosted app. So if it's being run from your own web server, it's, it's still on the same security level. Like you, you can't really do much more. And then I was talking about with packaged apps, uh, it's something that we refer to as privileged apps right now, uh, which means that you can access more APIs and you, you can access contacts, for instance, or doing cross-domain XML HTTP requests. Uh, and we also have a page on the, the wiki about the different web APIs. As you can see in the column with all the colors there, it shows which API it is, but also which platform we support with that API. So a D means that it's supported on Firefox desktop, A means that it's supported on Firefox on Android, and B in the right hand, which is the old code name for Gecko, which was Firefox a couple of years ago, if it's supported on Firefox OS. So then you can see with an API if it's supported across all the platforms. If with Blue, for instance, it means that it's certified, so it's only Mozilla right now that can access that for security reasons. Um, so it gives you a good indication what you can use across the board, or if it only works on one or maybe two platforms. And talking about building web apps, in your manifest file, you can also have a permissions part. And in the permissions part, you list what kind of certain APIs you want to access. So if you want to access the contacts, you just say, OK, my app is going to access the contacts. This is what I'm going to use it for. And you also specify what kind of access you want. Like, is it read create? Is it read only? Um, so the user knows. And the same thing with alarms here. And we also have on, on MDN, uh, which is the best documentation site ever. Yes. yes. Thank you. One. <laughs> um, and on the end, we have all the permissions listed. So you need what kind of, you can see what kind of permission you need to specify and how you specify it. So it outlines all kinds of access you can have. And looking at the APIs, so the regular APIs you can access from web content. This could be a web page, this could be within your hosted app. And there's a, a good number of them. And with the ones with W3C are the ones that have already been standardized. So I'm just going to go through a, a few of them to give you a feel of what it looks like to code with it. And we're also trying to make sure that when you access the APIs, that it's as easy as possible to write the code. Like, we don't try to have any super complicated names that only five people in the world actually understand. So it should be as intuitive as possible to work with it. And with the battery API, you, know, you can access the battery on the device. You have a few properties. You can check the level of the device, uh, how much power it actually has right now. You can check whether it's charging or not. Uh, you can also check the charging time, which means okay, how long time is going to take until my phone is fully charged. It doesn't only work on phones, it works on, on laptops as well. And then you also have discharging time, like how long time is going to take until it's discharged, and a few events to uh, detect what's happening. So basically, um, in, in this case, uh, <coughs> sorry, we have charging change. So you can see if someone's actually connecting the device in the AC adapter or if they're unplugging the device. And the interesting part here, of course, is that sure, you can build a dashboard showing how much better there's left. But it can also be depending on what you're doing with your app, how much power consumption do you want to use it. Like if you can see that the user has a low battery level, you might not want to start a syncing operation to the server or something like that. They're not used to most performant things in your game or something. Then we have a screen orientation API. And with screen orientation, it's more about trying to make the user experience better for the user. Um, so you can lock the orientation. You can lock the orientation to portrait, for instance, if you want, or landscape. But you also have a few other options. You can, for instance, say landscape primary. 
which means that no matter how you're holding the phone right now, when you start cap, it's going to go into landscape. But then, if you start moving it around, it's going to adapt to how you're actually holding it. Uh, we have the Vibration API, which is about vibrating the phone. Um, it was called the Vibrator API, but people had the wrong connection, <laughs> as you can see. Uh, so we moved on from that, um, because it was kind of hard to explain. Uh, and with the Vibration API, it's just, you know, vibrating device, giving a notification. So we have the Vibrate method, which accepts a number of milliseconds. So the one at the top here means that the phone is going to vibrate for one second. The second one is a bit more interesting because you pass in an array uh, and that's going to be a pattern which basically means that the first value is going to vibrate for 200 milliseconds and that's going to be silent for 100 milliseconds and that's going to vibrate for 200, etc. So you can have all kinds of different, you know, Morse code experience or whatever on the phone. And some people are building really interesting apps like that that you can have your phone in your pocket and you have navigation when you're riding your bike or something like that. And when you get to an intersection, it can vibrate once if you're supposed to turn left, or vibrate twice if you're supposed to turn right, something like that. And one point that I think is really interesting, especially as a JavaScript developer, like, you know, being along for a long time, we had HTML code, and then we had HR elements, etc. And then finally, we do image rollover, and it was amazing. Uh, and now, I think what gets really interesting, so we can connect our code to the physical world. So uh, with the um, uh, device proximity API, I can have a device and I can detect how close it is to something else. So if I move it around, it's going to tell me you know, how close or how far away it is. And the way you do that is basically you have a, a device proximity event, uh, which uses the metric system. And the good thing is you get back the value in centimeters. But you also have a couple of other properties. You have the max property and the min property. And the max property basically just means, okay, so the sensor in my specific phone, um, you know, how far can it detect? It's going to be 10 centimeters, it's going to be a meter. And the minimum means, like, how close can I get before you start actually caring how close I am? You don't give any actual value back. So in my mind, when I found about this API, I thought it would be amazing and you could move around everywhere. Uh, it doesn't support that far of a distance right now. So it only supports, you know, between zero up to 10 centimeters, which is that impressive. <laughs> but uh, I do think it's going to depend on the sensor in the device. And I think over time, we're going to support much bigger distances as well. And then it gets really, really interesting. Um, we also have the ambient light API. And with ambient light, it's about detecting the light conditions where you are right now. So if I have my phone and I want to pick it up in this room, it's probably going to be, give me a fairly low value, except for this one light. But if it's gone out in the bright sunlight, it's going to give me a really high value. Um, and what you can do with this is that you can have mood themes in your app and adapt the theme depending on you know, if you're in the living room or if you're out walking in the street. One, you can just change the CSS, for instance. Like if you're in bright sunlight, you might need another contrast in your CSS code make sure it's more visible. So you have a, a device light event. And the device light event returns the value uh, in a, a lux value. And the lux value ranges from 20 to 30, which is pitch black, up to about 12,000. And 12,000 is basically you know, rubbing it against the lamps. Uh, I tested. Uh, and, and, it, and the good thing there, of course, it goes all the way between there, but just sort of Remember that below 50 is going to be quite dark, and over 10,000 is really, really bright. We also have the page visibility API. I'm Swedish, so I have to have snow in my slides. You heard about snow? <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> this white stuff that you can. And something that's really easy with the page visibility is that you can detect from within your app if your app has focus. So if your app has focus, you might want to do something, and then you know, the user might leave the app, do something else, and then when it comes back to the app, you can do something else again. And the way you can detect that is that you have a visibility change event. And it's one simple property, you have document.hidden. So is the document hidden? Yeah, okay, well, you know, it's going to be in the background. Otherwise, yay, I have focus, and you do everything you need to. Then we have a few privileged APIs. And at this moment, you need to be the packaged app that has been approved by the Firefox Marketplace to be 
uh, or accessing these APIs. And uh, a few of them, like device storage, you can access files on the device, browser API if you want to build your own browser, TCP socket, contacts. System XHR is one thing I was talking about before, doing cross-domain XML HTTP requests. You don't need to use cores or something like that, you can just do a request to anywhere. And to take one example, if you look at device storage, uh, you have a navigator get device storage method, and you can, for instance, get into the videos folder. Um, when you're in the videos folder, you can create a cursor. Uh, so you can just enumerate over all the files that you have within that folder. And, and when you get a result for that cursor, you can use the file API in HTML5. So you can read out any kind of data about the file, like how, what's the size of the file, what's the type of the file, etc. And in this case, when you check the actual type of the file, you get the MIME type of the file, not just the extension. You know, you can check whether it actually is a video file. And then you can create the test player on the fly in the background. So it's like, you know, sure, it, it claims to be a video file, but does it actually play? And, you know, if it plays, then you know, okay, this is actually going to work. And then you can present the list to the user with files that you know will actually run on the device, not just, oh, it might be video, good luck. And we have this good uh, crossover, I would say, between the normal APIs that anyone can access, and then the privileged APIs, and also some of the certified APIs, which are only tied to us, like accessing the telephone, for instance. You don't want anyone on the web to be able to make calls on your phone for you. And that's something called web activities. So for instance, if you want to interact with the camera right now in Firefox OS, uh, you can use an activity. So within your JavaScript code, you call a certain activity, like in this case, the pick activity, and you can filter out what kind of files you want to pick. So I want to only pick image files from the device. Then I get a list on the device with all the apps that support that activity for that, those kind of files. So the wallpaper app, and the gallery app, and the camera app, so I'm like, sure, I can give you an image. And then the user can choose what kind of app it is. So it's a way of getting around, like, for instance, accessing camera, you can't access the camera directly from within your app, but through this way, it's a mix of your code and user approval. So the user will see a menu and they will you know, take the picture or do the call or something like that, and then you can do much, much more with your app. And the way you call an activity within your code is that you call a mass activity object. And with mass activity, you specify the name of the activity, uh, we have about 10 or 15 of them, I think view or pick or something like that. And you have data specifying what kind of data you want to send in to that activity. Like if it's filtering on PNG files, for instance. And then you have a success event handler and error event handler. And with the success event handler, you get some kind of data back from the app. And if you build an app to support a certain activity, let's say you have a tutor app or an image sharing app. In the manifest files for your app, as you saw before with permissions, you can also say that for activities, I support the share activity, but I only support it for PNG and GIF files. So if any app calls my app through an activity and calling share, I want you to display the sharing.html file to that user. And it also means with this position, I can choose how it's being presented to the user. Window means leave the current app and go into my app and do something. But you can also have this position in line, which means stay in the current context, keep on working by going to my app, choose an image, and then go back. And from within your app, you can set the message handler. So if any kind of web activity is calling your app, you have an activity event handler. And within there, you can, for instance, read out some data, and then you can use post results or post error back to the requesting app. Then if we look at the future APIs, uh, and I think it's really important to talk about the future and where we're going. And the interesting thing about the future is also to talk about what are the things that we couldn't have in the first version? Where, what are we going to do in the next version? What are we planning? What are we thinking about? Uh, so a number of the APIs that we're uh, working with are things like having NFC through a web API, having access to USB, if you connect the device to something, you can access the USB, calendar, spell checking, etc. One thing I like here, uh, where I think Android is much better than iOS, is 
that you can have any kind of keyboard. Like you, on an Android, you have Swift key and Swipe and similar, which gives the user a lot more options. And I definitely hope we can see more options as well on Park Console. It's like, of course, we try to make the keyboard as good as possible. But someone might have a different idea, and then we're going to offer them an API so they can hook in their own keyboard here. Another thing that's really interesting is where part you see. Like, how can we have peer to peer, and, uh, you know, proper communication directly on the web, through, not through any other weird protocol? And just the other day, we actually shipped WebRTC enabled by default in Firefox and Android as well. So I'm really excited about seeing WebRTC coming to mobile. But it's not really there in Firefox yet. Yeah, so it's being planned, it's going to be there um, within some time. Uh, but we're definitely looking at it. And initially, if you get a Firefox OS device right now, there are a few default apps being installed. Like, of course, a, a web browser, messaging, and calendar. And, Calls, which is a good thing. Uh, so these are the apps that we have pre-installed directly on Firefox OS devices. And then depending on the markets being released in, there might be a couple of extra apps from that local operator as well. And one thing I really like about Firefox OS is that since day one, everything has been available online. You've been able to see the code on GitHub, like you know, every commit you can see. And Firefox is being built up with three different layers. So we have Gonk, which is the small Linux kernel that just basically makes it possible to access the screen and things like that. And then we put Gecko on top of that, which is a rendering engine in Firefox. But then as soon as you boot Firefox OS, the visitor goes into a web browser window, and in that web browser window, you're going to see something called Gaia. And Gaia is the user interface in Firefox OS. And everything is HTML5 in there. And everything in Gaia is also available on the web. So if you want to figure out how the operating system works, how the user interface is being built, you can go here to GitHub. And you can see all the code. You can see, like, if you like a certain app, like I love the, the contacts app, I want to build something like that. You can go in there, you can look at the code, you can copy the code. And also, you know, if you have any ideas how to make that certain app better, you can just do a pull request. So, and that's the important thing, like we want to build this together, like we don't have any false beliefs that we're perfect and we're not going to get any feedback, we'd rather hear what you have to contribute with as well. And to get it started with Firefox OS, we have the Firefox OS simulator, which is an extension in Firefox. So you just install the extension and you can run the simulator directly. You have developer tools and debugging and such. And a number of the APIs, we try to mock support for them in, in the simulator as well. So it's a good start. Like if you have an existing website or existing mobile web app, you can run it directly in the simulator and you can see how it actually works. I also put together something called the Firefox OS Boilerplate app. And a number of these APIs that I was talking about, and then also the web activities, it's just a small test case. And, and the code is not dependent on any library, so you can just take any kind of small snippet in here and into your own app. So if you want to access the vibration, for instance, just take that snippet, and then you have that support. So it's a good way to get started and just see all the different things you can do on the device. And we have the Firefox Marketplace where you can have your app. You don't have to have your app there unless you want to. The Firefox Marketplace is just one of many options. So it's more about findability and for users to be able to find apps and for you to be able to have payments and sell apps if you want to. Uh, but you can also have the app completely on your own website and install it from there. And over time, we would also like to see different marketplaces. So we can have a, a marketplace that only targets games, for instance. So we're, we're trying to bring as many options as possible to people and not just saying like, you know, our marketplace is the only way and we're the only ones we can approve, etc. Because people love people like that. And as part of the marketplace, we have something called a developer hub. And the developer hub is just a collection of information for developers. We're talking about how to design apps, how to build apps, and also how to publish them. And I think my main point with this presentation today as well is just an introduction. And, and I'm going to be here for a few days so you can catch me or, or any of the other Mozilla people and ask whatever you want about all the details and then we can really dig into it. But I think what I want to sell to you today is the idea of trying things out. So a, a number of months ago, my daughter had a birthday and she was turning eight. So we gave them this small letter cookie. 
sitting having cake and a little birthday party, and they got this small thing you know, where each cookie is a letter. So one can be the cookie M, and one is the letter L, etc. Um, just to see, you know, they're, they're eight, they can spell things now. Maybe it's going to be something interesting. It took about 30 seconds, and this was the first word. <laughs> Which is a bit terrifying, uh, kind of a shining moment. Uh, but at the same time, what I like about it though, and, and, and the same thing with Firefox OS, I like the unexpected. I like when people just hack on things and, and you know, see what they can do with it. If you can break it, that's great, because then you find something that can be even better. So there's nothing wrong with that, and there's nothing wrong with, with trying and failing. As long as you actually you know, want to do something and have the ambition to hack stuff. That, that's what makes it really, really interesting. And then if you tear it completely apart, that's, that's fine too. I have this sort of thing, I have to have this in here. Um, so, um, just slightly over time, um, what I do want you to do, well, during this conference and also in the future as well, uh, just go out and have some fun. I mean, we don't live for that long. Uh, don't keep you serious, just hack away and then do some cool shit. That's what I expect from you. Thank you. Uh, we'll do a quick uh, round of questions. Oh, Emma? I have two questions here. The first one is like, when, when can we buy the phone here in India? And the other one is like, uh, is there any benchmark? Like people normally speak about native web apps and HTML5 and CSS apps. Is there any benchmark supporting that uh, uh, HTML and JavaScript apps are better in terms of battery and as well as speed? Okay, uh, so on, on the topic of phones in India, the thing is that we don't sell the phones. Uh, so we have different hardware providers and different operator partners. So it's been more about which operators that have been willing to partner with us. Uh, and initially it has been Telefonica, it's been doing Spain and South America, it's been Deutsche Telekom in parts of Europe, and then also Telenor in Europe. Uh, so uh, we haven't really had any a complete partnership yet in India. And, and with India, as far as I understand it, there, you know, there's a vast amount of operators and options and all that. Um, so I have no specific date. You know, I, you know, I could make things up, but I don't want to lie to you. Uh, and I would love to see it come to India. I, I think India would be a wonderful market for Firefox OS, uh, but it's not available just at this moment. And, and talking about the, the web versus native, I, I think one interesting exercise with Firefox OS as, as well, like right now, I mean, the different phones that we might have in our pockets are more powerful than the desktop computers we had a few years ago. Uh, and the interesting thing here is that we need to have hardware more low-level spec to be able to offer it for a certain price and, and make it affordable for people. So for me, I think it's quite interesting to see, like, you know, instead of loading um, four megabytes of data and every JavaScript library that was ever invented, you need to start thinking more and more about performance again and what things you actually use. Um, so, so to actually answer the question of the void it, uh, there are no perfectly concrete benchmarks. Like, people are trying to fit JavaScript benchmarks and then also we have a release schedule so something that was true uh, today might not be true six weeks ahead because we have a new version and you know that thing was fixed or improved or something like that. So I think the difference with Firefox OS is we're going to have more frequent releases, it's not going to be once per year or something like that. It's, it's more like with web browsers, we're going to keep iterating and make it better. Uh, and we're also trying to give advice as well, but not only for Firefox OS but any kind of you know, device that doesn't have the same performance as an iPhone because not everyone has $600 to buy one. Uh, so we're trying to tell people how can you make things work better on mobile. Uh, you know, should you use request animation frame instead of something else for canvas, etc., etc. Uh, and, and I'd love to give you, uh, and I can tweet later as well, but links to advice that we have. And then we have a few people working for us that have been building, uh, one person building the Crafts and JS game engine, and he was just listing all the advice that he has to make things as well. Um, so I, I don't have any actual benchmarks to give you and I'm looking into that. The interesting thing about benchmarks as well is that 
you can do benchmarks to prove your point, uh, but, but it's also really easy to piss a lot of people off and it, then get into a contest of just arguing about which benchmark is. Like, there's no one single ultimate benchmark that's the truth, right? It, it's all about perspectives. It's all about statistics. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'll stop talking now. I hope this helps. You catch me later if you Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, I just want to extend on what he asked before. Um, so it's the same thing, native versus web. If, you, if you're building games on HTML5, if you're using web gel, the performance is pretty much close to what you get on native, and it's really good. But when you're building applications which involve DOM, you don't really notice much of a performance issue when you're on a laptop, because your processes are really good. But when you're on your phone, you start seeing that the UI is never as fluid as you'd expect on a native app. So um, are there any work, is there any work going on to improve the performance of the way we render our things? Because JavaScript has become really fast, but the amount of work gone into rendering is not so much. And secondly, um, um, another thing between native and web is that most of the native platforms have a standardized set of uh, UI components, and that makes everything more consistent. Is there a plan for that in Firefox as well? Do we want to implement certain set of components so that most apps would look familiar to the users? Right. Um, so on the performance part, JavaScript is really fast. The DOM is a beast, no matter which platform we're talking about. Uh, I agree. Uh, and the, the thing with the DOM, though, of course, we're trying to make it better and more performant over time as well. But I think it also comes down to the habits of JavaScript developers. Like people, if you look at most use cases of JavaScript, they keep on accessing the DOM all the time. Like it's not always the most optimal. Right? Especially on weekend devices, like on a desktop you might not even know this, but on a phone, if you keep on accessing the DOM all the time, and doing things, attention and all that, you shouldn't need to keep in mind, or, or you know, so when am I willing to pay the price for this DOM access, like is it worth it? So I think it's delicate to balance between, of course, trying to make it better from our side, but also coding practices with it. Um, when it comes to uh, UI and, and, and guidelines, it, it's a really interesting topic, I and mean, I'd love people to talk to me later and tell me what you think about it. Because we have two camps there. We have one camp thinking that, well, it's just the web. The web doesn't have any guidelines. Uh, you know, it's free and open, and you build whatever you want. Uh, and then you have the other camp uh, where you can look at it. For instance, iOS had a lot of success for being very consistent. Like, it's a consistent user experience. Uh, and you think that we should have really strict guidelines for our box OS. Um, so what we're trying to do is, is find a middle ground. Like if you want to build your own thing, no matter how it looks, you, you can do that. But if you have something that looks like the native apps, uh, or pre-installed apps, native is this word doesn't really mean anymore, uh, but like the pre-installed apps, uh, one thing is that you can look in, in Gaia, for instance. Like if you like one of the pre-installed apps, you can look at that exact code and you can copy it to your app. Another thing is that we have something called the building blocks. Building blocks are basically snippets. Um, so you have HTML snippets and CSS snippets to make sure that it looks like the pre installed app. We're also looking more and more into web components. Uh, and we have something called Scylla Brick, uh, which is just making more modular components for building, well, app headers and content and things like that. So we're trying different options. So, people, so it's not just, you know, we have to use this library, we have to use this guideline. It's more about you have the smorgasbord of options, but you know you pick what works for you. And then, of course, it's Firefox 1 and 2 right now, so we're also trying to figure out what works best, what gives the best results for app developers. All right, we have time for one last question, and then you can get about Grover and the other levels. For that, yeah. Um, thanks for the talk. My question is uh, to do with open web. So, in, the, in this context of uh, surveillance and stuff. I know Mozilla is you know, committed to the open web, that's for sure. But then, in terms of communication technology, uh, what is Firefox OS's promise to mobile users? You know, people are paranoid using even Android, or you can't trust all the Androids or all of Android. So that way, you know, in, in that context. So, so, so what's the point with Firefox OS for users? So, is, the, is there uh, something Firefox OS users can expect in terms of uh, 
in, in terms of privacy and stuff? Right, okay. Uh, so we, we have something called Mozilla Persona. Uh, so we're looking at integrating it in Firefox as well, uh, on, on a more bigger scale. Uh, but just to make sure, if, if you look at the web, if you look at integrity, uh, any website you go to, uh, you can comment with a Facebook login, right? Uh, or you can test an app or something like that. But to do that login, they can access all of your data. Like, you know, if I want to write a comment, they want to know when I was born, where I grew up, all my friends, what I'm interested in, etc. And it's not very really relevant, I would say. Um, so with Persona, for instance, we're trying to, in general with Persona, trying to build up an identity system for you where the data is encrypted, no one else can actually access it, and you're completely in control. Uh, but initially with Firefox OS, it, it's more about <clears throat> right now to getting an open platform out into the market and make it available for people, and also evaluate where we can go forward from that. Uh, so it's like, it, it's an early days for that. We do want to do that. We do want to help protect integrity in any way we can, but it's, it's early right now. All right, awesome. Everybody give it up for Robert. <laughs> <laughs>